Please take your copies of God's Word and turn to Matthew chapter 4. To Matthew chapter 4. We have been in a series of sermons in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, but that series was interrupted for about two months as we were considering uh, other things in the preaching of God's Word on Sunday mornings. Uh, so we're to return today to our series in Matthew's Gospel, and I briefly remind you of what we've seen so far uh, in Matthew and in this series. In Matthew 1, uh, the chapter begins, the Gospel begins with the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, uh, followed by the account of Jesus' birth uh, and the uh, word of the angel to Joseph. In Matthew 2, we have the account of the Magi who come to visit Jesus and honor Him with a gift of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, uh, followed by the family's flight into Egypt after Herod threatens uh, to murder the child. In Matthew 3, we have the ministry of John the Baptist, as well as an account of Jesus' baptism at the end of the chapter. And then in Matthew 4, uh, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness where He engages in conflict with the devil. He is tempted by Satan. Jesus has the victory over the evil one. It is an initial victory that is a prelude to the victory to come at the cross. And then Jesus begins uh, His public ministry. He comes as a light to shine upon the world, and He calls His first disciples, and that leads us to the passage we're in now. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, I'd like to read through Matthew 5, verse 2. Please follow along as I read. Matthew 4, verse 23, and he, that is Jesus, went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread, and they brought him all the sick. For those having seizures, paralytics, had he healed them. Great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Matthew 5, verse 1. He went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Let me ask that we pray once more together. Let's pray. Our Father, 2,000 years ago, our Savior, prayed to you, Father, sanctify them in the truth, for your word is truth. So we pray that same prayer now for ourselves, sanctify us in the truth. We believe your word is truth. Do this, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Uh, we arrive today in our exposition of Matthew's gospel uh, to what I've called in your bulletins the most famous sermon ever preached. That's the title of today's message. Maybe you're visiting with us and you saw that title and you thought, what a great Sunday we've come. We're going to hear the most famous sermon ever preached. <laughs> well, you're not going to hear that sermon. You're going to hear about that sermon. Uh, this will probably be a very ordinary sermon. But I want to direct our attention to what is probably the most famous sermon ever preached. Matthew chapters 5 through 7, which we often refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, form perhaps the most well-known section in all of the gospel accounts. Uh, and I do, don't mean uh, well-known only to Christians and to the church throughout the ages. This sermon also receives a great deal of attention by those who have no real believing connection to the Christian faith at all, but nonetheless respect and appreciate the lofty teaching of these chapters. You might just think of all the lines from the Sermon on the Mount that we often hear repeated. Uh, maybe in the arenas of literature or history or culture, even sometimes in popular culture, uh, phrases like the pure in heart, the salt of the earth, a city on a hill, one jot or tittle, let your yes be yes and your no be no, turn the other cheek, where your treasure is, there your treasure or there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters. Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Uh, judge not that you be not judged. Uh, how about uh, remove the log from your own eye? 
and then you will be able to see the speck in your brother's eye. Or do not throw your pearls before a swine. And of course, what's going to be known as the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. These and other phrases from the Sermon on the Mount have sort of entered the uh, cultural and uh, social lexicon, at least in the West. And moreover, the ethical teaching of the sermon has had an enormous influence on the fields of moral philosophy and social ethics, uh, even on the legal code in many nations. It has done that, had that effect on the legal code of the United States. Uh, even on other world religions, which will often imitate in their own tradition something like uh, the Beatitudes, those first verses of the sermon, or the Golden Rule, which seems to find expression in some form or fashion in every world religion. The point is, uh, people with no discernible connection to true Christianity nonetheless come under the influence of the Sermon on the Mount on a day-to-day -day basis all the time. Uh, but apart from the sermon's relevance to the secular world, the Sermon on the Mount has also occupied a place of special priority throughout the ages in the history of the Christian church. It's been this way throughout the centuries, and there are a number of reasons for this. The Sermon on the Mount has often been used as one of the primary passages in Scripture to help with what we call catechesis or discipleship. If you want to go to one passage to help new Christians understand what it means to follow Christ and what it looks like to be a disciple, well, this passage, Matthew 5-7, through has often been used to help disciples understand uh, their elementary responsibilities as disciples of the Lord Jesus. Moreover, in the sermon, you also have some passages that have been central to Christian liturgy uh, throughout the centuries, uh, like the Beatitudes uh, or like the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we utilize both of those passages in a special way, in a focused way, in our liturgy here at Emmanuel. We'll often recite those passages together. Uh, if, if you were to go into many of the old churches in England uh, and you were to walk in, often you would see displayed on the wall the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, and the Lord's Prayer uh, as passages repeatedly worshipers would come to set their minds upon as they uh, walk into worship. Uh, furthermore, many Christians throughout history have simply acknowledged the obvious, and that is that the Sermon on the Mount includes some of the most exalted, beautiful, and compelling teaching our Lord ever offered and that it provides the best summation, perhaps, of the moral teaching of Christianity. Uh, John Stott, a famous theologian of the previous century, spoke for many, I think, when he said, the Sermon on the Mount has a unique fascination. It seems to present the quintessence of the teaching of Jesus. It makes goodness attractive. It shames our shabby performance. It engenders dreams of a better world. We begin this morning our consideration of this great sermon, and my plan is to have us in this sermon for a while. Uh, I think where we are as a church and where we are as a culture demands special attention to the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. So if we've been going through Matthew up to this point at about 50 miles an hour, we're going to slow down to about 5 miles an hour for the next few months. Uh, we're just going to idle in Matthew 5 through 7. But in all seriousness, I do this because increasingly, I think the Sermon on the Mount is one of the most important passages in all the Bible. Uh, this sermon contains, at the same time, uh, some of the most elementary teaching in the Christian faith and also some of the most profound. I think we can say of the Sermon on the Mount, what the commentator Leon Morris said of the Gospel of John, it's like an ocean in which a child may wade and an elephant can swim. It is both simple and profound. It is for the beginner in the faith and for the mature Christian. Its appeal is immediate and never failing. Uh, even now, I can remember when I was first converted. Uh, we had a Sunday morning, Sunday evening service in the church that I was converted in. Uh, Bill Hughes was the evening preacher. And right after I was converted, he began a series in the Sermon on the Mount. And I remember as a new Christian how helpful that was for me uh, to be rooted in uh, this teaching on discipleship that we find there in those passages. And going over it now, some uh, 20 or so years later, it's been fruitful to consider again, and I'm impressed more and more with how profound the teaching of our Lord is in these chapters. Uh, now next week, I'm going to introduce some more contextual matters related to the sermon when we begin our exposition of the Beatitudes. This morning, I want us to simply ask and answer one question, and that is, what is the Sermon on the Mount itself? 
What do we have in the Sermon? What is uh, the Sermon on the Mount? And as I see to answer that question, I just want to say this could be a, a preface to the entire series. Um, I'm aware that about nothing I say uh, from this pulpit is original. Uh, preachers read so much, they take in so many influences. You're just always aware you kind of got things from somewhere, but you don't always know where. Uh, in this series, I'm drawing on a lot of different influences and a lot of commentaries and books that I read on the Sermon on the Mount. And I just want to say up front, uh, I'm benefiting from many helpers. Sometimes I will cite those helpers. Sometimes I will not because otherwise I'd be bringing so many names up that you probably don't know or care much about. Uh, but I'm aware in this sermon in particular, the help of a number of individuals, especially John Stott, uh, Kevin DeYoung, and uh, our own Robert Fisher in thinking through this passage. So what is the Sermon on the Mount itself? What do we have in the sermon? John Stott said, the Sermon on the Mount is probably the best known part of the teaching of Jesus, though arguably it is the least understood, and certainly it is the least obeyed. I think he's probably right about that. If you study the history of interpretation surrounding the Sermon on the Mount, you become aware very quickly uh, that it has been interpreted in a host of different ways throughout the centuries. And I don't mean in terms of like individual texts, like you know, this guy interpreted this verse this way and this guy disagreed with him. I just mean there's been lots of different understandings of even what the Sermon on the Mount is, like as a body of literature. Uh, how are we to receive the sermon? What are we to get by the sermon? How are we to view the sermon itself? Now, I'm not going to review uh, all the different interpretations there have been throughout the history of the church. Uh, Don Carson, in his commentary, lists eight different popular interpretations uh, of the sermon. But I do want to identify this morning four incorrect ways we can read the Sermon on the Mount, and then we'll consider how I think we ought to read and understand the Sermon on the Mount. Briefly, four incorrect ways of reading the sermon. Number one, uh, treating the sermon as a legalistic blueprint for securing God's favor. First incorrect way we can read the sermon is treating the sermon as a legalistic blueprint for securing God's favor. Now, I've not found any commentators asserting this error. But I think it's possible for us, functionally, as readers of the sermon, uh, to make this error, to view it in a legalistic kind of way. Now, whenever you bring up the L word, legalism, I think it's helpful to kind of define what it is. Uh, first of all, what legalism is not. Legalism is not Christian people who are interested in honoring the law of God. Legalism is not obedience to God's law. Legalism is not as we sung and then read in Psalm 1 about delighting in God's law and meditating on it day and night. If you are passionate about honoring God through obedience to his law, that's not legalism. What legalism is, is endeavoring to establish your merit before God on the basis of law keeping. To say, by doing this, I secure the favor of God. And by not doing this, I can fall out of the favor of God. By keeping the law, I bring my merit to the table and achieve and accomplish for myself a standing of righteousness before God. That's what legalism is. The Sermon on the Mount is not a legalistic blueprint for securing God's favor. You cannot turn the message of this sermon into do this and you will live. In fact, the order seems to be the reverse. Because you live, do this. Jesus is in effect saying, because you are my disciples, follow me in this way. Because you have God as Father already, therefore walk as obedient children in this way. And Martin Lloyd-Jones says, quote, we are not told in the Sermon on the Mount, live like this and you will become a Christian. Rather, we are told, because you are a Christian, live like this. This is how Christians ought to live. This is how Christians are meant to live, end quote. Uh, I, I quoted a number of weeks ago, Sinclair Ferguson uh, has that great quote. He, he talks about how being is always what leads to doing. You get the order wrong, doing leads to being, you'll become a legalist. But it's always being who we are in Christ, born again, saved by his grace, united to him, that leads to proper conduct and to right living and to obedience to the Lord. Being leads to doing. In other words, these are not prescriptions to be met in the Sermon on the Mount, in order to place one in a position of God's favor. But rather, these are commands and prescriptions to be followed as those already in a place of God's favor. Jesus does not want us to be, or excuse me, he does want us to be obedient to the Sermon on the Mount. He does want us to submit our lives to the precepts of the kingdom, but he wants us to do so from the standpoint of those who have been born again. 
of those who are already members of the kingdom of heaven. So don't let our consideration of the Sermon on the Mount over these months turn you into a legalist. That's not how the sermon is meant to hit you. The sermon comes to us in the context of the gospel and in the context of discipleship. The Jesus who came, Matthew 1, to save his people from their sins is the Jesus now who calls us, those he has saved, to obedience as an expression of humble discipleship and loving obedience to him. So first of all, do not treat the sermon as a legalistic blueprint for securing God's favor. A second error we could make. That is treating the sermon as an exposition of law meant merely to convict us of sin and point us to the gospel. That's sort of the other end of the spectrum. Treating the Sermon on the Mount as an exposition of law meant merely to convict us of sin, sort of make us hopeless in our sin. Well, thank God for the gospel, we have that. So a very popular preacher preached a series on the Sermon on the Mount some years back, and he titled the series, The Glorious Impossibility. He said this, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus wants to set us free by showing us our need for a rightness that we can never attain on our own. The Sermon on the Mount is about an impossible righteousness that is always out of our reach. And the preacher went on to talk about how the main function of the Sermon on the Mount is to show us how sinful we are and to point us to Christ who has fulfilled the law in our place. That is entirely wrong-headed. Now, it's certainly true that one of the functions of the law, particularly when we're lost, is to expose our sin and to point us to Christ. But the law has more functions than that. The Sermon on the Mount is meant to be obeyed by the Lord's disciples. It's not just meant to crush us and render obedience impossible. Jesus really expects his followers to follow these precepts. Of course, not perfectly, but nonetheless, he holds forth an ideal of perfection that we're always to be aiming toward. It's evident by even a cursory reading of the Sermon on the Mount that these precepts of Jesus, he expects us to obey them. He expects us to follow them. We, as the redeemed, as the Lord's disciples, are meant to obey what the Lord gives to us in the Sermon on the Mount. A third incorrect way of reading the sermon. Number three, treating the sermon as a blueprint for social progress and renewal. Treating the sermon as a blueprint for social progress and renewal. Many have read the Sermon on the Mount this way. Uh, They see it as a sort of manifesto for social activism and social justice, uh, which is one of the reasons why so many non-Christians who nonetheless try to latch on to the Sermon on the Mount, it's one of the reasons why they do that, because they believe they see in the sermon a kind of platform for this worldly social renewal here. But of course, Jesus in this sermon is not trying to present a blueprint for social progress and change. He's not developing a legislative agenda He's not providing a program for the city council. This is not a platform for social justice. He's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to his church about how they're to live as his peculiar people, his particular people in this world. In other words, the whole thing falls apart if you don't acknowledge Jesus as Savior and Lord. I'll go even further and say the whole thing becomes incoherent outside the framework of a saving, submissive relationship to Christ. If you think you just sort of externally impose the Sermon on the Mount on people who don't love the Lord Jesus, it's a little bit like trying to run um, uh, Microsoft software on Apple hardware. It just doesn't work. Mark, my computer guy, IT guy, he's telling me no way, okay? He just sort of made a face at that. It doesn't work. To think that we can obey the Sermon on the Mount and follow the Sermon on the Mount on the, in, in the way that Jesus envisions for his people apart from the new birth, And apart from a saving acknowledgement of him as Lord and Savior, is to totally misunderstand what's going on in this sermon. It's to rip out the heart of the sermon itself. Far from being a blueprint for the wider society and culture, John Stott actually summarizes the Sermon on the Mount by calling it the definitive Christian counterculture. In other words, there are actually indications in the sermon all throughout that the community Jesus is envisioning in this sermon actually operates in the context of the world's opposition. It assumes that, uh, that this counterculture is existing and living within a surrounding culture and society that is hostile to Christ and his ways. 
Now, of course, it's true. If the Sermon on the Mount were fully realized in our world, it would be nothing short of heaven. But that cannot come about by simply imposing the Sermon on the Mount externally upon a godless culture. There must be new birth and regeneration or else the Sermon on the Mount falls flat. I think this is the fundamental fallacy of the social gospel. Uh, these precepts the Lord calls us to live by, they make no sense outside the framework of new birth and regeneration. They can never be achieved. They can never be realized socially. If people do not bow the knee to Jesus and submit to him as Lord and acknowledge him as their savior and their teacher and their master. The same thing I think can be said of a connected error uh, that is making a minor comeback in our day. And that is treating the Sermon on the Mount as a blueprint for how national governments should be organized. Uh, this view is common among the neo-theonomists and Christian reconstructionists. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it at all. I say this for the benefit of those of you who know uh, what that is. I want you to see it's a twin error uh, to those who see in the Sermon on the Mount an agenda for social justice in the secular world. Here the focus is not society and culture, but the government and the political arena. Uh, this error would see it as our job as Christians to impose the Sermon on the Mount externally upon the nation and the legislature as if the Sermon on the Mount can exist and thrive outside the context of faith in and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. But friends, that's not why the Sermon on the Mount was given. Jesus doesn't conclude the sermon by instructing his disciples to impose these precepts on the Jewish leaders or on Rome or upon any government or jurisdiction. This is for Christ's followers. This is for his church. These are the precepts by which those who have entered his kingdom are to live, a kingdom, we're told, that is not of this world. All right, the fourth and final incorrect way of reading the sermon more briefly some will read this sermon, they will treat it uh, as oriented entirely toward a future age. That we should read the Sermon on the Mount as a sermon oriented entirely toward a future age. Uh, this is especially common in dispensational theology, uh, which will tell you that the Sermon on the Mount is a description of what the future age of the kingdom will be like. It's all in the future. We may make small efforts now at following the sermon's precepts, but the point is to show us what some future age of the kingdom will be like. Uh, but I don't think we could abide that interpretation, again, just by a cursory reading of the sermon. This is for us in the here and now as the Lord's disciples. You know the main way I know that? Not only does Jesus seem to talk that way in the sermon, but it's clear his disciples interpreted it that way. Uh, so we were in 1 Peter not long ago. Uh, the more I read 1 Peter in conjunction with the Sermon on the Mount, the whole epistle of 1 Peter appears to me to be just an extended exposition of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Peter took the Sermon on the Mount with him wherever he went. Uh, he saw in the Sermon on the Mount principles of discipleship by which we are to live now in a hostile world before we get to the age that is to come. Uh, you can look at Ephesians 4 and 5. Uh, after uh, Paul's extended meditation on the gospel and the grace of God, in chapters 4 and 5, it's basically the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, or Romans 12. I was reading Romans 12 with a couple this week. Romans 12, 9 through 21. Uh, and it's amazing the parallels between that passage and the Sermon on the Mount. The disciples, the apostles, clearly interpreted this sermon as something that applies to the here and now. So they meant to instruct us now in this age as the Lord's people in terms of how we're to live. So those are four incorrect ways of reading the sermon. But now positively, how should we read it? How are we to interpret it? And I encourage you as I present these things, I hope to return to them throughout the series, but hang on to them as we read through and work through uh, these chapters over the coming weeks. I think they will help us understand what we're to glean from this sermon as we study it together. Three things I'd like to convey by a positive nature uh, that tell us what the Sermon on the Mount is and how we should interpret the sermon. Number one, it is a sermon for disciples about discipleship. It is a sermon for disciples about discipleship. This is so important for us to appreciate. Who is the primary audience of the Sermon on the Mount? Would you be able to glean that from the verses that we read, 423 through 52? Who's the primary audience of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? It's not the crowds. It's the Lord's disciples. Look at chapter 4, verse 25. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis 
and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And why he did that is not entirely clear, but perhaps to get to a more elevated position from which to speak. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, taking the typical posture of a rabbi, when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, who is Jesus speaking to? It's his disciples. It's those who have already been enlisted as his followers, those who have already left all to follow Jesus. Now, it's possible the crowds are there listening in. In fact, I feel sure the crowds are there, the cr crowds are there listening in. They're sort of around the mountain, but the disciples are close, and they're sort of listening in to Jesus teaching for his disciples. I feel certain about that because Matthew records the reaction of the crowds at the end of this sermon in Matthew 7, verse 28. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. But make no mistake, the primary audience we learn in verse 1 of chapter 5 is the disciples themselves. You get this wrong and you'll become a legalist. If you don't understand that Jesus is speaking to those who are already in a saving relationship with him. Those who already have been enlisted by the Lord himself to follow him. Jesus is speaking to those who are his disciples already. And that conditions everything he says in this sermon. So just consider the internal evidence of the sermon itself. What can we see in the sermon about who Jesus' audience is? Well, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he says to his audience, you are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. Jesus would never say that about unbelievers. He's speaking about those who are his people, those who are his church, and they're to be as this city set on a hill uh, in the midst of a hostile world that people might see their good deeds and give glory to their Father who is in heaven. Uh, you can think also of the many times Jesus will instruct his disciples to think of God as their Father. Actually, 17 times uh, Jesus will instruct his disciples to think of your Father or our Father. In other words, he's speaking to those who already have God as Father. Oh, they're already the children of God. He's not speaking hypothetically about how to enter that kind of relationship. He's speaking to those who already are the children of God, and thus he instructs them about how to pray. Our Father who is in heaven. He talks about your Father who sees in secret. He will reward you openly. He's speaking to his disciples. Uh, you might think uh, also of the many times in this sermon Jesus will contrast the community of his disciples with others. There's a big us and them thing in the Sermon on the Mount, not in an ugly tribal way, but just in the frank acknowledgement, the Lord has his people, and there are those hostile to his people. And so he will distinguish often throughout the sermon his people from the Pharisees, or his people from the surrounding hostile culture, from the Romans. He'll distinguish his people from false professors and the like. Now, friends, we must grasp this at the outset. Jesus is speaking to his church in this sermon. Uh, he's speaking to his followers. He's speaking to the redeemed and the regenerate. He's speaking to the sons and daughters of God, those who already have God as their father. He's speaking to his disciples. We need to know from the outset this isn't an evangelistic sermon. This is a sermon for disciples. And as this is a sermon for disciples, it is a sermon then about discipleship. In other words, it's a sermon about how to follow the Lord aright as his people. As I said, we as God's people are meant to obey the Sermon on the Mount. We're meant to take notes in class, as it were. Here's the teacher. We take notes, and then we apply what it is the teacher is teaching to us, to our lives. We come with a holy curiosity. What is it that our Lord says about anger? What is it the Master has taught us about bitterness? What does he teach us about lust and about forgiveness, about loving my neighbor? And the response of the eager disciples to these lessons in discipleship is to submit to the Lord's teaching and to follow his commands. Now, again, I remind you, this is crucial to appreciate because this sermon will call us to a high standard of righteousness. Uh, in fact, it will call us to nothing short of moral perfection. Uh, Jesus tells his disciples that their righteous deeds must shine in the world in a way that compels people to give glory to God. He says their righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. He says you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The righteous standard in this passage is indeed great. And it will crush you unless you realize that this is not a righteousness extracted 
from unbelievers in order to bring them into a state of favor with God. This is instead a righteousness that God enables his followers to pursue and to realize. This is for regenerate people who have the Spirit of God within them. It is those who have already been made into followers of Christ by the power of grace, which means this is not a righteousness externally imposed upon us from without, but a righteousness that arises from within as those who have been born again by the Spirit of God. Uh, you might recall over the summers we were looking at Old Testament passages uh, that direct us to the coming of Christ. One of the passages we considered uh, was the promise of the new covenant as it's articulated in Jeremiah 31. There's this coming new age, this coming new covenant. And what is going to mark God's people in the new covenant? It's going to be different from the old covenant. In the old covenant, you had the law written on tablets of stone, exposed externally, excuse me, imposed externally uh, on people. But in the new covenant, what's going to distinguish the new covenant people? God is going to write the law on their hearts. In other words, he's going to give the gift of regeneration. He's going to enable obedience that will arise from within through a new power implanted in them through the new birth. So as we read about this righteousness, the Sermon on the Mount will talk about, we're to understand the Lord enables us by grace and by the power of his spirit to obey these precepts and to follow in the very steps that he has sought out for us. The sermon is meant to be obeyed. The purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is not to overwhelm us with an unachievable standard of righteousness that leads us to throw our hands up in exasperation and just sort of collapse back into our justification by faith. We will often need to collapse back into our justification by faith. Lord, I'm not meeting the standard. I'm a sinner. I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need to be assured again that I am right purely and totally and only through the merits of Jesus Christ and what he has done in my place. But the primary effect this sermon is to have is to call us to a standard that is achievable, that can be realized by the help of God's Spirit. This is how Jesus wants us to live as his followers. He's saying, come, let, let me show you how to deal with bitterness in your heart. And let me tell you how to think about lustful thoughts and how to put them to death. Let me help you think through and teach you how you're to live in light of the anxieties that you feel. Consider the birds of the air, the flowers of the field. This is the Lord helping us to walk in the paths of righteousness, to walk according to his precepts as his followers and as his disciples. And so I want to say here at the front end of this series, Christian, you can do this. You can live as a happy disciple in light of the Sermon on the Mount. You can live according to the precepts of the Lord. I love what Martin Lloyd-Jones says here. He says, quote, the Lord Jesus died to enable us to live the Sermon on the Mount. He has made this possible for me. He came, I say, and lived and died and rose again and sent the Holy Spirit in order that you and I might live the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, friends, you, you know this. Uh, the same grace that saves us, Titus 2 tells us, is the grace that also trains us uh, to live upright and godly lives in the present age. Uh, we know, of course, Jesus predestined us. He called us in order that we might be conformed, excuse me, God the Father called us in order that we might be conformed to the image of his own dear son. And we know that it's by grace that we've been saved, not according to works, lest any man should boast. But we are saved, Ephesians 2.10 tells us, for good works, that we would walk in them. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And God has given us good works and good deeds that we're to walk in as his people. This is a standard that the Lord calls us to, to follow as his disciples, eagerly to please him as we walk in the paths of righteousness. Okay, point number two. What is the Sermon on the Mount? It's a sermon for disciples about discipleship. Secondly, it's a sermon about life in the kingdom of heaven. It's a sermon about life in the kingdom of heaven. We first considered the theme of the kingdom uh, when we looked at John the Baptist's announcement of the kingdom in the opening verses of Matthew 3. The term kingdom is used some 55 times in Matthew's gospel. It's usually uh, referred to as the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Well, what is the kingdom in Matthew's gospel? What is, how would you think about it? Well, I first remind you of what it's not. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is not simply heaven. I used to think that as a kid. Uh, a Christian dies, you go to the kingdom of heaven. 
Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a state that those who have died in Christ go to. But of course, as we saw when we looked at Matthew 3, the kingdom of heaven is a present tense reality. It is an arena in which we live now. There's a sense in which the kingdom of heaven is broken into this world in the present. We don't just await the kingdom of heaven's inauguration. Uh, furthermore, I must emphasize the kingdom of heaven is not to be conceived chiefly as a geopolitical realm or a nation, or a country, or Christendom, or the Holy Roman Empire, or something like that. The kingdom of heaven, at least in its current manifestation, is not spatial or national. It's not like it's a piece of real estate with borders, and now you enter this kingdom, and now you're in the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's not the nature of the kingdom, at least in the present. Uh, thus, the Bible does not speak typically of us bringing the kingdom, or building the kingdom, or expanding the kingdom. I know we sometimes talk that way, but the Bible doesn't typically talk that way. Rather, it speaks typically of us receiving the kingdom, entering the kingdom, belonging to the kingdom. And there's a very good reason for that. It tells us something, I think, about the nature of the kingdom itself. This might work as a basic definition of the kingdom. And I'm very appreciative at this stage uh, for the help of uh, Robert Fisher, brother in this church, good friend. The kingdom of heaven is God's righteous reign and rule. It's God's righteous reign and rule. Don't think of it as a country with borders. Think of it as a rule and reign we come under. The arena of the Lord's reign and rule. It is his righteous reign and rule whereby he saves his people from their sins, punishes his enemies, and recreates the world. The kingdom was promised in the Old Testament it is inaugurated in Christ, who is incarnation, death, resurrection, and ascension. And this kingdom continues now in the present under the reign of Christ, as men and women come under his saving rule. It will be fully consummated at the second coming of Christ. For the note takers, just email me. I'll send that to you, okay? <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is the reign and rule of Jesus Christ. It is the reign and rule of Christ by which he saves his people from their sins, punishes his enemies, and recreates the world. Uh, brings about a new creation, reconciles all things to himself. Now, there's two qualifiers I want to make. And that is that, first of all, Matthew will emphasize the fundamental spiritual nature of the kingdom. Okay, so the kingdom of heaven is a spiritual reality. Uh, it has physical manifestations in the church. And one day, of course, it will be gloriously physical. It will involve territory and land that you can measure out. But Matthew's going to emphasize uh, that the kingdom of heaven is the Lord's spiritual rule. It's in some ways invisible to our eyes, but it's a rule that we come under by faith in Jesus Christ. The second qualifying comment I should make is that Matthew is going to emphasize the redemptive aspects of this rule. Now, it's true that this rule will entail the destruction of all of Jesus' enemies. There are those who will be put outside the kingdom. There are enemies of the kingdom. Uh, there are those who Jesus will triumph over through his kingdom. Uh, but those effects are primarily associated with the second coming. What Matthew will emphasize, what we should emphasize in the present, is the redemptive aspect of this rule. That even now, the, the kingdom is expanding through the work of Christ, and he's bringing men and women under that reign and rule in a redemptive kind of way. The primary feature of the kingdom of heaven is the reign of God through Christ over his people. So, for example, in John 3, when Jesus is interacting with Nicodemus, the issue is how one can enter the kingdom of heaven. How does one do that? Well, it's not by going to some physical address. It's by being born again. It's by a spiritual reality of regeneration in the heart that is carried about by God's Spirit. If you want to enter the kingdom of heaven and become a citizen of Christ's kingdom, you must be born again. The kingdom is the special redemptive arena of God's reign and rule. It's manifest now in the present, especially through men and women coming to salvation in Christ by faith and living as his people. And it will be consummated, finalized, completed at the second coming where we will have final salvation. We'll see the destruction of all of Jesus' enemies and the total recreation of the cosmos. Okay, now, what does all that have to do with the Sermon on the Mount? 
What does it have to do with the chapters before us? And I'm asserting the Sermon on the Mount is all about life in the kingdom of heaven as a present tense reality. The kingdom of heaven is mentioned by name eight times in the sermon. It pervades, the idea pervades the entire sermon itself. Jesus is showing us what life in the kingdom is like. What does it look like to come under Jesus' reign? Well, the Sermon on the Mount gives us the precepts, the laws, and the commands of the kingdom. It shows us what the arena of Christ's reign looks like. When men and women come under his saving rule, how do they live? How do they walk? Well, you can think by way of illustration. Um, in, in our home, it's quite common uh, for one of my children, if they want something, to start with their mom. Okay? Uh, they, they, they are coming under her authority, as you will. Saying, can I have a bowl of ice cream? And if they don't like uh, my wife's response, they have this ability to sort of bring themselves out from under mom's authority, to go over a couple of rooms over and find dad and come under his rule and reign, acknowledge his authority, and ask, can I have the, the bowl of ice cream or whatever? What, what are they doing? Well, acknowledging in their hearts, I can submit to whichever master I want, right? It's an acknowledgement of a certain kind of reign and rule. And of course, if I'm wise, knowing a, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand, I'll just say, whatever your mom said, okay? Well, that's a trivial way to illustrate an important point. Uh, what we see in the Sermon on the Mount is how citizens of the kingdom of heaven live. What does it look like, really, to come under the reign and rule of Jesus? What does it really look like to repent and turn from our sins? and to follow after Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount is showing us that. Those who acknowledge Jesus as their Lord and Master and as their teacher, they live in this kind of a way. Uh, this is the royal law. These are the precepts of the kingdom. This is how those who acknowledge the authority and the reign and rule of Jesus, this is how they walk and how they live. This is how they think about their enemies. This is how they think about virtue. This is how they think about their responsibilities toward those who are in authority over them or how they respond to those who persecute them. This is how they pray. This is how they deal with anger and lust and the rest. It's showing us what it means to live as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And so Martin Lloyd-Jones says, the Sermon on the Mount is a perfect picture of the life of the kingdom of God. John Stott says, the Sermon on the Mount portrays the repentance and the righteousness which belong to the kingdom. That is, it describes what human life and human community look like when they come under the gracious rule of God. And so I ask, where then do we see life in the kingdom of heaven most visibly manifest, most clearly seen? Well, it's not in national governments. It's not in local jurisdictions. It's not even in a family where you might have some who are believers and some who are not. The principles of life in the kingdom of heaven are most clearly seen in the church. That's why I'm so fond of referring to the church as an embassy of the kingdom of God. It's a beautiful image. Uh, the kingdom of heaven uh, is a present tense reality, though it exists now in a world that is hostile. It is a kingdom that is not of this world, and yet you know how an embassy works. If the United States has an embassy in France, when you are in the United States embassy, you are in the kingdom of heaven itself. Oh, excuse me. You're in the United States itself, okay? I'm jumping ahead to my point. You're in the United States. That's United States territory. And all the rights of United States citizenship apply to you in the context of that embassy. You're outside that embassy. You're in hostile territory. Well, I don't mean to say that when we gather in this building, all of a sudden there's some sort of special effect whereby we become, you know, the Lord's people or citizens of the kingdom. But it illustrates we as the church, we are the manifestation, the visible picture of the kingdom of heaven in this world today. If people want to know what life in the kingdom of heaven is like, they need only look at the Lord's people and how they live and respond to the Lord Jesus, how they live in obedience to him, how they walk, how they live, how they interact in community with one another. Brothers and sisters, this here that we enjoy as the people of God is the manifestation to the world of what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like an embassy of the kingdom of heaven in the here and now, which is why Jesus can speak of the community of disciples as like a city set on a hill. It shines to the world. People see in the church, in the community of disciples, life in the kingdom of heaven, life under the gracious reign and rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, what it is like 
and how we can see it. It really is extraordinary to see the repeated attempts of men to build a kind of utopia in this world. I'm always astonished, you read history, astonished at their optimism. Just think like the modern era. Whether it's the communists in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, so sure that the socialist revolution would succeed and would usher in a communist utopia, a kind of brotherhood of men. Uh, you could think of Woodrow Wilson style progressivism. You know, things are getting better. You know, human anthropology is improving. Optimism about where humanity is going. Uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s beloved community. Or the contemporary hopes that somehow the internet or technology or the global economy or some other force will reconcile us all and bring us into a kind of new Eden. Uh, friends, in a world burned out on such vain hopes, what an opportunity for the church to shine as the community of the people of God, the kingdom of heaven here in this world demonstrated in our life together as the people of God. Uh, we're meant to exude something of the character of God to the world. We're meant to embody something of the principles of Jesus Christ and his heart and his will for humanity. The kingdom of heaven and its embassies in this world in local churches are meant to be sort of pictures of what human flourishing is meant to look like in the way that Christians, though imperfectly, live with one another in the family of God. Well, may the Lord help us truly to be the light of the world like a city on a hill. Third and final point, and very briefly, what is the Sermon on the Mount? And we must get this if we're to interpret these chapters correctly. It's a sermon for disciples about discipleship. It's a sermon about life in the kingdom of heaven. And it's a sermon that is meant to bring us to Christ himself. It's a sermon that is meant to bring us to Christ himself. What is Jesus like? What are his notions of what human flourishing looks like? What is his law? And what does his law tell us about his heart? In the home that I grew up in, it was a Christian home. And um, we had on the wall... The if-then chart. Out of curiosity, anybody have an if-then chart in their home? Okay, I got a couple homeschoolers here. Okay, great. <laughs> the if-then chart. If you hit or bite or kick or throw, you know, three spankings. Uh, if you lie, five spankings. If you steal, etc. All, all down the line. It sort of corresponded to the Ten Commandments. And... Um, I don't criticize my parents for that. Kids need legalism in the first few years of their lives, okay? They just need law. Here's the if-then chart, okay? The law. And I knew a very clear system of penalties, or excuse me, offenses and penalties. As I got older, uh, the, 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 the offense that was most um, significantly punished in our home was lying. Okay, I'm not saying that it should be that way in every home, but it was that way in my home. And as I got older, uh, that if-then system began to reveal things to me about my parents. And little by little, I began to see their expectations for me, as reflected in that chart, as really a beautiful and wonderful thing. It was a reflection of their will for me, how I can flourish, how I can thrive. It was an expression of their good purposes for me, their desire that I would learn to walk in truth not in lying, that I would learn to walk in peace with my brothers and sisters and not in strife. I began to see their expectations for me and their standards for me as an expression of their heart. Okay, now all analogies break down, but that's something like what we have in the Sermon on the Mount because we as God's people don't just want the law. We do want the law, but more than that, we want the lawgiver. We don't just want the rules, we want the ruler. And we learn about him through his rules, which Psalm 19 tells us are clean and upright. We don't just want righteousness, we want the righteous one. 
You see what I'm saying? We're going to see in this beautiful picture of righteousness something of the heart of Jesus Christ. It reveals something to us about his moral beauty, his moral perfection. Uh, as we read in that quote from John Stott, you read the Sermon on the Mount, it engenders dreams of a better world. It's a beautiful standard that even those outside of Christ throughout the centuries have acknowledged as a beautiful picture of righteousness and moral purity and of rightness. Well, if these are the laws of the kingdom, what must the king be like? And so I hope even as we seek, by God's help, to follow the precepts of our King Jesus, I hope we'll see revealed in these weeks something about who he is in his moral beauty. We're meant to follow the beam of this sort of precept, this law, all the way up to the lawgiver and to see him as wonderful and perfect and righteous. We're to see him as the ultimate fulfillment of the Sermon on the Mount. Well, may God help us to find Jesus in this series of sermons. We will need his atoning blood as we see all the ways in which we fall short. We'll need his example to see how we, like him, can follow in his steps. We'll need him to show us the way. Most of all, we'll need his enablement by the Holy Spirit to live out the precepts of the Sermon on the Mount as we're meant to as those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we pray as we approach uh, this sermon over the coming weeks, God willing, we do ask that you would so firmly root us all in the gospel of grace, in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ that has been shed for us to cover us, to purchase pardon, redemption, and forgiveness for us, to make propitiation for all of our sins. For all of us who are your people, may we appreciate what it is to be forgiven and to be born again and to be enabled now by the help of your spirit to live for you and to follow you. And we pray that that would bear the fruit in us of a genuine excitement about doing your will, following your ways, walking in obedience to our Savior. Help us, Lord, to be faithful disciples, to see what you have called us to in this sermon and to see it as a lovely thing, to see it as beautiful, and to see it as something you call us to, that you have enabled us to realize by the help of your Spirit. And we pray, Father, that you would help us here at Emmanuel Church to so live out the principles of your kingdom and the precepts of the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. uh, that our witness would be enhanced, that people would see reflected in this community a beautiful expression of human flourishing under the sovereign rule and reign of Christ. And may they be prompted uh, to come in, to enter the kingdom of heaven, to be saved themselves, and to come under the rule of the righteous one, the Lord Jesus. We pray, Father, that you give us grace in this. We pray, Father, that as we consider uh, the will of our Lord for our lives over these weeks, that none of us would be tempted toward legalism, that none of us would be tempted toward establishing a righteousness on the basis of our works, but that all of us would rejoice in the grace that is ours in Jesus Christ and that we would rejoice in the power of grace to train us and to change us and to help us to walk in the paths of righteousness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.